Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast which focuses exclusively on British murder cases with the occasional glimpse at some horror movies. I am your host Stuart Blues and this is the second episode of season four. Thanks to everyone who has gotten in touch with me to give their views on last week's controversial and more importantly tragic case. The biggest argument amongst my listeners appears to be whether Olga Freeman, who was the subject of last week's episode, should be in a prison as opposed to being in a secure psychiatric hospital. This was extremely evident on TikTok when I put a little video up sort of summarising my episode and linking it back to the podcast. A lot of people thought she should be in prison, a lot of people thought poor woman, and a few of you reached out to me as well, so it's good to sort of generate that feedback and get people talking about it. If you've no idea what I'm talking about, I would urge you to check out last week's episode. It was on the murder of Dylan Freeman, a 10-year-old boy, by his mother, Olga Freeman. As ever, let's move on to the first of two opening segments. It's time for this. Welcome to Daddy Facts. That jingle is too cute. It said, if you didn't understand it, welcome to Daddy Facts, because that was my little girl who did the voiceover work there. She speaks fine, but you know what it's like when you try and get kids to record on cue. They just will not do it. Each week, I read out a random dad fact from a pack of cards my daughter got me a few years ago. I think it was a Father's Day gift, and I've already prepared the removal of said card from the pack, so we're not rustling on the audio. And here is this week's dad fact. In 2008, a team of Russians set up a barbecue 335 feet wide and cooked over 500 sausages in a bid to host the world's longest barbecue. <sighs> hmm. I wonder what kind of sausages they used. Did they use a special glaze? One that perhaps had a certain spirit in it? Mr. Vodka? So it says longest. It obviously means... The widest, because that said 335 feet wide. So it's not long. Being a bit pedantic there. Yeah, again, useless dad fact. Not going to save you in the jungle, is it? One day we will get a dad fact that will save you in the jungle. I'm just confident of it. I'm confident and we'll know we've got to that point when we reach it. But now here is the second and final opening icebreaker segment. It's time for this. The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. Hiya! Here's a violent one. One deep breath, remember. Bloodlust eating me, crazed brutality desired, corpse fucked violently. That's, um, that's a savage one, Rose Bundy. <laughs> As a reminder, a haiku, which is what that was, is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of five, seven, and five and like i said it's meant to be read in one breath if you're interested in that kind of stuff the book is called the serial killer's book of haiku by friend of the show rose bundy there is a link to it in my bio if you are interested but without further ado let's move on from that rapidly and let's get into this week's episode this case was suggested by listener lucas parsons Lucas sent an email to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com asking me to cover it and I simply added it to my episode list. This entire season, season four, is made up of listener suggestions, so if you do want me to cover a case and get a shout out, please do get in touch. A lot of people have, and 10 episodes for season four, all scheduled, all listener suggestions. I've also got two so far for season five, so I do listen to you, I do put them in my episode list. Please keep getting in touch with your case suggestions. It saves me a job having to figure out which case to do. As always, let's start with a look at the area where this story takes place. This week, we're in the South Yorkshire city of Sheffield, so not too far from where I am in West Yorkshire. Fun fact number one is that people from Sheffield are apparently referred to as Sheffielders. Now that's news to me, I must say, I've never heard that term before. The only time I've been to Sheffield in my life was to see my favourite band, Metallica, on February 28th, 2009, which was at the Sheffield Arena. That arena has gone through a few name changes since 2009. It changed its name first to the Motor Point Arena Sheffield, then it went back to being called the Sheffield Arena, before it changed its name once more to the Fly DSA Arena. That's the DSA being Doncaster Sheffield Airport, I believe, so Fly DSA. 
The name changed again earlier this year, 2021, and is currently known as the Utilita Arena Sheffield. I'm guessing that's sponsorship, Utilita. Not heard of that. Fun fact number two is that my podcast music intro was written by a Sheffielder. David John Brady is his name. He's a good pal who I've known for close to a decade now, just through work. The song I use for my intro, if you're interested, is called Throw Down the Gauntlet. If you want to know more about David John Brady, I just call him Dave. <laughs> There's a link to his stuff in the episode description. Okay, quick fire fact time, then we can crack on with the story. Number one. Sheffield has more trees per person than in any city in Europe. For every individual in Sheffield, there's around four trees in the city. It does have field in the name, I suppose, which kind of makes sense. Never thought about that. Quick fire fact number two, Sheffield has a district energy system that uses domestic waste to produce thermal energy, which is converted to electricity and hot water. So it basically runs on recycled energy. Three, the World Water Bombing Championships take place in Sheffield every year, but that's quite fun. Four, Sheffield FC is officially the oldest football club in the world. By football, I mean soccer because everyone calls it football apart from North Americans. I'm not talking about Chef United or Chef Wednesday either. I'm talking about Sheffield FC. It was formed in 1857 and they currently compete in the Northern Premier League Division 1 East, which is... Probably semi-pro, I think. A couple of divisions under the League 2 in the conference, so it's probably step 7 or 8 on the ladder. And finally, fun fact number 5, Sheffield produces as much as half of the world's surgical blades used in hospitals. It's probably why Sheffield United are referred to as the blades. And that's it for random facts about Sheffield, I promise. <laughs> if you're new here, it's probably too late to warn you that I do go through some random history on the town or city where the events of each story takes place. Regular listeners will know this and it's probably a Marmite thing. You either love it or you hate it. Let me know what team you're on. Team love or team hate. Maybe I should try and get a couple of hashtags trending. The villain in this week's episode is a man named Anthony Antonio or simply Tony. We'll call him Tony for sake of ease, but I think he did actually go by Tony to his friends, which clearly I'm not. The surname Antonio, so it's spelled A-N-T-O-N-I-O-U, appears to be of Greek origin and originates from Antonius, an ancient Roman clan name that is believed to translate as praiseworthy or priceless. Now, ironically, those two words are not ones I would use to describe Tony. Indeed, he was of Greek Cypriot descent, but he lived in the Sheffield area of Parsons Cross. When I was researching this case and putting together my script, I was a bit unsure as to how I would go through the chain of events. As with many of these stories, there's little to no historical background information available about either the suspect or the victim, so it makes it a tad challenging when it comes to putting together a timeline. I do like to follow the events of each story in chronological order as best I can, so hopefully this one is just as easy to follow as my other ones are, fingers crossed. I decided to start by telling you who Tony used to be in a long-term relationship because it's quite interesting. It was someone famous, so I'm not just teasing you here about his random ex-partner. It was actually chart-topping British singer-songwriter Louisa Gibb, better known as simply Gabrielle. That's her middle name, if you're wondering. She topped the UK charts in June 1993 with her debut single, Dreams. I can't play a clip of it for copyright purposes, but it's a song that goes, Dreams can come true. You like that, don't you? I can't believe that's the first time I've sung in four seasons. I'm not even going to apologise. I think, to be honest, Gabrielle and I share the same voice talent as we were both born on the same day, albeit 20 years apart. To clarify, I'm the youngest. Gabrielle won a Brit Award for British Breakthrough Act in 1994 and went on to win another Brit Award for British Female Solo Artist in 1997. She started her relationship with Tony in 1992, though it appeared as if Tony was still married to another woman at the time. They remained together for three years, with the pair expecting their first child in 1995. When the day came on April 16th, 1995, Gabrielle was thrilled to welcome her son Jordan into the world. Tony, on the other hand, not so much. 
Apparently, he chose to terminate his relationship with the rising R&B singer on the same day their son was born, though he did attend the birth. Gabrielle said, The day I gave birth was the last time I ever saw him. You stay classy, Tony. Regardless, Gabrielle said that they started to grow apart towards the end of the pregnancy. Tony would often promise to visit her, but usually just ended up no-showing. Let's come back to Tony now and look at what we know about his life. In 1979, Tony's mother Aphrodite married a Sheffielder named Mr. Walter McCarthy, though it seems that Aphrodite moved back to Cyprus in September 1995. Seeing as the events I'm building up to take place in December 1995, I'll go out on a limb and assume Walter and Aphrodite were still married, or at least they still were legally when she moved back to Cyprus. But why didn't Walter move to Cyprus with her, I hear you ask? The reason is that he co-owned a fish and chip shop named The Lazy Codling with none other than his stepson, Tony. How delightfully British, by the way, owning a fish and chip shop. For context, Sheffield is right in the middle of the country. You'd have to travel at least 80 miles east or west to reach the nearest coast. Saying that, we import most of our fish from Norway anyway. To say they were co-owners of a business, it doesn't seem like Walter and Tony were the best of friends. On December 21st, 1995, only four days before Christmas, Tony put in motion a plan that he had been preparing for months. Along with his friend Timothy Redhead, I'm unsure if his surname describes his appearance, they tricked Walter into going with them for a drive in a Nissan Turbo. Nowhere specifies whether this was Tony's car or Timothy's car, but if I had to take a guess, I'd probably go with it being Timothy's car, simply because Timothy was the driver that evening, and it's the only logical reason for him to be involved at all with these events. So Timothy is driving, Walter's in the passenger seat, and Tony's in the back. As they made their way from Sheffield to the Derbyshire Peak District, Tony withdrew a commando knife from his pocket and started violently stabbing Walter in the back as Timothy pulled into a lay-by on the A57, one of our major roads in England. Now he didn't just stab him a couple of times, Walter was stabbed 52 times by Tony in the back as well as his hands because presumably he probably attempted to defend himself from the onslaught. Evidently, stabbing Walter 52 times wasn't enough for Tony. What happened next is something straight out of a Quentin Tarantino movie. Tony removed a two foot long Japanese ceremonial sword from its saya. I think I'm saying that right. It's S-A-Y-A. -A. It's the Japanese term for a scabbard, the sheath you keep swords in. And he proceeded to decapitate Walter. So he's already stabbed him in the back from the back seat 52 times with a commando knife. I just picture a massive Rambo sort of thing. And then he's took him out of the car, withdrawn a Kill Bill style samurai sword and chopped his stepdad's head off. Absolutely brutal. It's like a ceremonial thing. Like a sacrifice almost. Really strange. Tony and Timothy dumped Walter's body behind some rocks at a landmark named Cutthroat Bridge on the A57 out of Sheffield. Now this is a popular walking spot and it was named Cutthroat Bridge after the body of a man was discovered there around 400 years ago. Now the body of the man naturally had his throat slit or cut, which then let the bridge be called Cutthroat Bridge. Word of mouth, that's how these things get their weird names, isn't it? It was a local man named Robert Ridge who found the body and him along with two others took the victim to Bamford Hall, which is an Elizabethan house that was demolished in 1951, where he sadly died two days later. Lucas Parsons, who recommended this case, informed me that the bridge is located at the bottom of a large lay-by which is well known by walkers. There's free parking there, I'm told, which we love in the UK, and apparently it's just a lovely walk around Lady Bower Reservoir if you're lucky enough to find a parking space, that is. If any of my listeners are keen walkers and have visited Cutthroat Bridge or Lady Bower Reservoir or anywhere that's a nice walk that's fairly near, please do get in touch. I'd love to hear more about the place. I really should do more walking. If anyone can recommend some good walking boots or some routes, I should just go to my mum and dad really. They walk everywhere. But as usual, I digress. Let's get back to our gruesome tale. 
With Walter's body hidden at Cutthroat Bridge, Tony and Timothy decided to take his head and dump it somewhere else. Maybe they thought that he couldn't be identified if they got rid of his head because it's not attached to the body. Doesn't really make sense, but then again, does stabbing someone 50 odd times and chopping their head off make sense? No. They buried the head 150 miles away in a woodland area in Bedfordshire. It's an area they had scouted during a previous reconnaissance mission. The weapons used in the killing were said to have been acquired by Tony from a friend, I don't think they were lent, he actually bought them, in November 1995, so that was the month before the murder. It didn't take long for Walter's body to be found. Police were informed of the discovery of a body at Cutthroat Bridge the very next day. Walter McCarthy was identified as the victim after police went through the documents left in his clothes pockets. It seems weird that they went through the trouble of driving 150 miles to bury Walter's head somewhere else, but didn't check his pockets for any identifying documents. Again, I guess you're not thinking right in that moment, naturally. The story does go a bit dark and vague from there, because it seems as if Tony was initially arrested as a suspect, but he was subsequently released on January 7th, 1996. There's a couple of newspaper articles round about Christmas Eve time 1995, so a couple of days after the actual murder happened but they weren't aware yet, and it said that Walter had gone missing, so the headline would be fish and chip owner gone missing or something like that, and they kept saying that they were looking for his co-owner, which was Tony, and he hadn't been seen since I think the 22nd of December. It's not clear as to why they let Tony go after initially arresting him, but one would assume that they had insufficient evidence at the time. What is clear is that Tony visited Gabrielle's South London flat at some point in January 1996 after his release, the month after the murder, whilst he arranged to have the Nissan Turbo involved in the crime torched. The car had been left in a garage since the murder and I guess Tony wanted to use Gabrielle as an alibi for when he got rid of it. I say garage by the way, not garage. Again, I apologise for some of the missing details in this story, as there is only a handful of sources out there regarding this case, but it looks to me like Tony was arrested again either later on in 1996 or at the start of 1997. What I do know is that Tony's trial for murdering Walter McCarthy took place in March 1997. Working backwards logically, I think my timeline kind of makes sense. It does to me anyway. The prosecution was led by Peter Joyce QC, who gave extremely graphic information regarding the death of Walter. Peter said, His head had been cut off above the lower jaw and the head was missing. Mr McCarthy was fully clothed and it became apparent from his documents found on him that his name was Walter McCarthy of Halifax Road, Sheffield. In reference to Tony staying at his ex's flat to arrange the disposal of the Nissan, Peter said, it started as a business association, but then it became a quite different relationship. She has a child born on April 16th, 1995 by Mr. Antonio, and it was somewhat out of the blue that Mr. Antonio reappeared. Antonio and Gabrielle hadn't been in touch much for a long time, but Antonio at that stage traveled to London where he stayed in a flat belonging to her and made arrangements for the car to be disposed of. Gabrielle was then called to the stand and had the following to say about her former partner and father to her child. He was a kind and considerate man who would spoil me rotten. He was always romantic, buying me presents and giving me little surprises. Killing someone would be totally out of character for him. At first, Tony denied killing Walter and disposing of his body. However, he went on to admit taking part in everything. With regards to a motive, Tony said that his stepfather would often boast to him about cheating on his mum with other women and, shockingly, that he enjoyed sexually abusing young boys and girls. Tony also said that Walter had sexually abused him when he was a child. Whether those claims are true or not, only Tony will know. But check this out for something truly bizarre. This is just odd. When I read this, I was like, wow. I'm pretty speechless to be fair because I've never heard something so weird and I've seen a lot of true crime research. Tony said that as a child, Walter would tell him that if a head was removed from a body, it stays alive for 20 minutes until it runs out of oxygen. Now that 
is something straight out of Carl Pilkington's brain. So having been told that, Tony, after eventually severing Walter's head after 30 to 50 blows with the ceremonial sword, allegedly taunted the head for a period of, you guessed it, 20 minutes. I'd like to point out as well that the sword clearly wasn't sharp, because notoriously they are razor sharp. 30 to 50 blows? That's just awful. Tony explained how he had dragged Walter's body from the car to behead it, and then picked the head up by the hair and placed it in the passenger seat while he talked to it, later putting the head in a bag in the boot or the trunk. He said, <laughs> Honestly, I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. This is what Tony said about putting Walter's head in the car, right? He said, I wanted to have a little chat with him. I talked to him until the 20 minutes was up. I put my two fingers on his nose and mouth to see if he was still breathing. I was convinced he was still alive. I was in a world of my own. I did not plan it. For its final journey, Walter's severed head apparently sat between Tony's feet. You honestly can't make this shit up. Now I understand that people might not be in the right frame of mind when they do these things, but that is just ridiculous. I mean, to say that he's not planned it when he's got a commando knife, stabbed him 52 times, then dragged his body out and got the ceremonial Japanese sword, which he's clearly got in the car already as well, and decapitated him, then spoke to... Come on. Are you with me? <laughs> Let's, I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. When it came to the end of the trial, Tony received a life sentence, which has been a mandatory punishment for murder in the UK since the abolishment of capital punishment in 1965. What happens with life sentences here is that it doesn't actually mean life, that would instead be a sentence of a whole life tariff. A whole life tariff is what Wayne Cousins has recently been handed, the killer of Sarah Everard. That means he has no possibility of parole, no possibility of ever being released. Whereas a life sentence usually gives you a minimum term. So it might be a life sentence with a minimum term of 20 years, let's say. After 20 years, you'll be eligible for parole and potentially release. You might not get it granted, but you can still at least apply for it. In England and Wales, the average length of a life sentence before early release is roughly 15 years. So usually when someone's sentenced, from what I've seen, it's between normally 20 to 30 years. 15, it's round about that. Between 10 and 30, let's say. Let's be conservative. Having said that though, I can't actually see whether or not Tony was actually given a minimum term to serve. It appears that he was just handed a life sentence and that's it. But after a review of the case in 2007 at London's Royal Courts of Justice, the Honourable Mr Justice Royce, a former judge of the High Court of England and Wales, ruled that Tony, who was 41 at the time, would be allowed to apply for his release after serving 14 years behind bars. So Tony did just that. In 2011, Tony applied for parole and was released from prison, though he only behaved himself for four years. In January 2015, Tony arrived back in his home country of Cyprus, settling in the popular tourist city of Larnaca on the country's southern coast. By doing so, Tony violated the terms of his parole as he was unauthorised to leave the UK. In 2016, the Larnaca District Court was overseeing the process and Tony remained in custody at the Nicosia Central Prisons. Unfortunately, the story just goes stone cold after that. I cannot find one single article or newspaper report that details the whereabouts of Tony during the last five years from 2016 to 2021. Now that pisses me off because it kind of feels like an unsolved case and this podcast is always about solved cases. Obviously it's not unsolved because he got caught for murdering Walter, he went to prison, he served some time, but I'd just like to know where he is now. I just apologise that I cannot find it for the life of me. I hate loose ends, as you can probably tell. Now, as for Gabrielle, she ended up doing very well for herself. Her 1999 album called Rise spent three weeks at number one on the UK albums chart. It also achieved four times platinum status. She's gone on to sell millions of records worldwide. I think she's doing okay. With regards to Timothy Redhead, 
I'm not sure what sentence he received for his part in Walter's murder, but I did find an article from June 2008 which said he had appeared in court in connection with a hammer attack at a Lincolnshire pub. Timothy was charged with assault with intent to commit grievous bodily harm and having an offensive weapon. The victim of that case suffered head and eye injuries and at the time of the article was said to be in stable condition in hospital. That case also went cold. The last piece of information available said that Timothy was due to appear before Lincoln Crown Court on June 20th, 2008. Couldn't find anything more. Oh, how frustrating. But there you go. That was the story of murderer Anthony Antonio. Not the longest story I've ever done, but the story is only ever as good as the availability of articles surrounding the case. Thanks again to Lucas Parsons for suggesting this one. I'd also like to thank my newest Patreon members, Mark Strickson, Woody, Katie Howard and Deborah Freeston for supporting the show. A massive thank you as well goes to Jesse Rizzi for buying me five beers on buymeacoffee.com slash British Murders. Jesse said, Hi Stuart, I'm a new listener from America. I've really enjoyed the episodes of Killer Stories when you're a guest, so I figured I would give your show a listen. I love your subtle yet fab sense of humour, as well as the short, succinct dives into cases that are mostly new to me. I also love the bit of waffling at the beginning and the dad facts, even though I'm not a parent or a man. Keep, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for the show. I'm about to go buy Bobby a few beers as well. Bobby hosts Killer Stories. Feel free to save one of yours for a virtual toast next time you collaborate. Be well. Thank you so much for that, Jesse. It just shows that podcast collaborations do work, fellow podcasters. Start liaising with other podcasters, ASAP. I've no new reviews to read out this week, so make sure to leave me one on iTunes or Podchaser, and I'll make sure to give you a shout out on an upcoming episode. For more on British murders, please check out my social media channels as well as YouTube. I'm thinking about starting filming my episodes again. I did that for most of season three. I'm trying to figure out how to streamline the process. I might just get a good webcam and film it directly on the laptop as opposed to my phone. Hopefully the editing will be smoother and the transfer won't have to worry about converting file types and all that. So watch this space, maybe from back end of this season or season five, we'll see. Merchandise is available to purchase as always at Teespring. You can support the show on Patreon and buy me a coffee. You can email me case suggestions or just get in touch by British Murders Podcast at gmail.com or via social media. But for now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.